For the last few weeks, I've been racking my brain trying to figure out how to handle my Psychonauts review. We're talking about one of my favorite games of all time here. Hell, without it, I don't even know I'd be who I am today, and that makes it very hard to be objective about it. Psychonauts has problems, I'll be the first to admit it. The platforming and camera controls can be overly finicky at times, the gameplay pacing is really awful, although the pacing of the story is great, and going for 100% completion is a pain in the ass thanks to poorly thought out collectible placement. But I've played it so much, four times at this point, with two runs at 100% completion, that I don't really see a lot of those problems anymore. The platforming physics and combat are almost second nature to me at this point, and I remember most of the tricky figments off the top of my head now. So being critical about Psychonauts is really hard for me. In my brain, I know it's probably a gold medal game at best, but in my heart, I want to give it a platinum. And all that aside, I don't know how much I could add that other reviewers haven't already covered outside of pointing out how how well the 60s tinged Burton-esque graphics have aged. But the other day it hit me. Instead, I should do what I do best. Tear apart one small, positive aspect of the game, like, say, a level, to figure out what makes it tick. And Psychonauts has some great level design, five that I'd rank among the best of all time, so there's plenty to work with here. You can consider this the tentative start of a new series, What's in a Level, where I'll dissect excellent examples of narrative and gameplay design. I might also end up analyzing things like mechanics or boss fights, so for the sake of future categorization, I'm going to be putting these all under a blanket series called What's in a Game. To start off, we're not not gonna tackle the obvious candidates like Black Velvetopia or the Milkman Conspiracy that have already been talked to death, although I will certainly come back to those if this becomes a thing. Instead, we're going to be looking at one of the game's more overlooked and underrated stages, Gloria's Theater. A lot of reviewers are prone to saying that a game's world is a character in itself, and while normally that sounds a little trite, it's literally true when it comes to Psychonauts. Or, to be more accurate, the characters are the world. So in order to really understand everything that's going on with the game's levels, we need to understand the characters who create them first. Gloria Van Guten is a once popular stage actress interred at the Thorny Tower's home for the disturbed on Lake Oblongata after she suffered a mental breakdown following her mother's suicide. She parades around the asylum flower garden in front of an audience of pots with faces painted on, apparently having deluded herself into thinking it's a stage. In order to get deeper into the asylum, Raz needs to disguise himself as the insane dentist who runs the place, Dr. Lobato. One of the items needed for this disguise is Gloria's Emmy-esque acting trophy, which features three prominent claw-like points. But if Raz so much as looks at it before he dives into her mind, oh, Oh boy does she ever make him regret it. At first she's pretty open to him asking questions about it, but as soon as she steps out of the spotlight her mood shifts violently. Because you don't think I deserve it! Gloria suffers from bipolar disorder, although contrary to popular belief, the rapid violent mood swings aren't actually what defines that disease. Bipolar, or manic depression, is typified by prolonged cyclical episodes of depression and mania, funny how names work, that can last for weeks at a time. Gloria is clearly in the middle of an episode, but the question is, what kind. Out of the two faces of bipolar disorder, depression is perhaps the most widely understood, although there are still a lot of misconceptions about it. Still, most people basically understand that depression entails bouts of extreme, inexplicable sadness, fatigue, anxiety, social withdrawal, and suicidal thoughts. We don't see much of this in Gloria's actions outside. What we do see is a woman suffering from grandiose delusions, inflated optimism and self-confidence, erratic behavior, continuous talking, and fast, unfocused trains of thought, all symptomatic of a manic episode. You know what else is symptomatic of mania? Hair trigger bouts of rage and aggression. Yeah, manic episodes aren't just periods of extreme unhealthy happiness. Every emotion is driven to extremes by manic energy, especially anger. Gloria also displays paranoid thoughts of persecution and apparent insomnia, which indicates that this is probably an episode of dysphoric mania, that is, mania with depressive symptoms mixed in. Once we enter Gloria's mind, the disorder and its root causes are made manifest. Gloria's mind is presented as a theater with little children in flower costumes reenacting key moments of her life over and over again. This shows that she is stuck in the past, reliving her glory days and wallowing in the worst days of her life instead of moving forward. From the peanut gallery, an obese critic named Jasper heckles every performance. He's the little voice in Gloria's head that expresses all her self-doubt, but he's not so little anymore, and his voice has been amplified by her bipolar disorder since her mother hit the stage. He didn't like her performance either? No, I mean hit the stage, cause splat, jump from the 
catwalks while Gloria was in Paris. Yeah, that's what the janitor said, too. In the back room, sobbing, or, well, miming that she's crying while the PA loops a tape of someone else sobbing, is the gruff-voiced Bonita Soleil. You mean the personal muse of Gloria Von Guten? Her inner sunshine? The spirit of her youth, yes. In order to sneak into Bonita's room and talk to her, Raz needs the power of invisibility. This serves as the second soft barrier to entry in Psychonauts, the first being the need to obtain a cobweb duster in order to complete the Milkman conspiracy. These barriers force Raz to run around the hub world of Whispering Rock Psychic Summer Camp picking up collectibles, since he needs to be at 20% completion to buy the duster and 30% to earn his invisibility merit badge. Most players will probably reach these milestones well ahead of this point, since the hub world itself is plenty of fun to explore. Hell, I might do an episode just talking about all the cool stuff in the camp, and the previous levels easily contain enough collectible figments to make up the difference. If they haven't, though, it serves as a general reminder that, hey, there's a whole open world out there that you haven't explored yet. Once Raz can turn invisible, he's able to talk to Bonita, which is pretty dang funny in itself. Unfortunately, the upshot of it is that Bonita won't return to the stage unless someone does something about the theater lighting. Oh, and also the phantom who's trying to kill her. I do so hope that my mother is proud of me! The Phantom represents the self-sabotaging impulses holding Gloria back. He hides up in the catwalks above the theater, representative of her deep subconscious, and according to both Becky, the stage director, and Jasper, the critic, the only way up there is to run a specific play on a specific set that has a hot air balloon on it. To find that script, Raz will have to run a number of other plays in order to reconfigure the sets. On the first candy-colored set, we see a bunch of unbearably chirpy flower children reenacting Gloria's breakout performance in Sunshine Shenanigans. Exiting through a magic gateway at stage right triggers the next act of the play, but there's not much that can be done here other than collecting figments, so Raz needs to flip the script and change the mood lighting. As you can probably imagine, that's not just a theater term on this level. Switching to the tragedy mask filter on the spotlight magically transforms the entire stage into something a lot darker and less friendly, and we see a new play about Gloria's miserable time at the Hagatha Home boarding school, which she was sent to by her mother. Mechanically and thematically, this is by far the least pleasant part of the level. Tricky enemies swarm you from every angle the second you step onto the stage, and you have to deal with them while searching for scripts and fumbling through your inventory to solve puzzles. It's kind of obvious that the two sets represent Gloria's two bipolar states. The Sunshine Shenanigans set is way, way too happy, with everything that happens to Gloria on it filtered through delusions of grandeur. Everyone loves her, and those that don't are just jealous of her success. These memories are clearly filtered through a manic worldview. The Horrors of Hagatha Home set, meanwhile, is straight up painful. The subject matter of each play is a aggressively, comically miserable, and everything that happens on it ends with Gloria's character suffering, or in most of her fantasies, straight up dying. The constant attacks on her self-worth and possible suicidal ideation Great, well, I'm off to go kill myself. are definite hallmarks of a depressive state. While these stages are colored by Gloria's mental state, they do reveal a lot about her past, how her love for her mother was gradually clouded by resentment over being abandoned, and how she eventually eclipsed her mother's own fame. They also showcase some of Gloria's most deeply rooted fantasies, such as being saved by the father she never knew. And of course, while all of this character development is really interesting, I'd be remiss if I didn't praise the level for presenting a clever puzzle that's pretty fun to solve, along with some unique and challenging enemy encounters. It kind of sucks that all of these new, different enemy types are thrown at us all at once, but it's a necessary evil of the level layout, and like I said, this game has pacing problems. I can't overstate just how much I love this level's aesthetics. The twisty world of the Milkman Conspiracy and Black Velvetopia tend to get the most love from fans, but the art direction in every level of Psychonauts is really strong, we can thank Peter Chan for that, and for me, this stage is a standout. I appreciate little details, like filling the seats with figments of Gloria's imagination and converting common hazards like fire or the hand of Galoccio into cardboard props. I love the way that the set decoration shifts from chipper to dour, and the theater itself does a great job of evoking the tense but cozy atmosphere of an old playhouse mid-rehearsal. And the music. Oh man, the music. LucasArts vet Peter McConnell is one of my favorite composers. His tracks for Monkey Island 2, Grim Fandango, Sly Cooper, Hearthstone, and Brutal Legend add so much to each of those games. His range and skill are incredible, and Psychonauts makes full use of his talents. I could go on and on and on about how this soundtrack sets the mood for each area, but I'm only talking about Gloria today, so we'll save that for another video. The song that plays on the happy sets is, for want of a better word, insane. It shifts rapidly and and incoherently between annoying carnival music and frantic, nearly amelodic xylophone hammering. Its chaotic composition perfectly captures Gloria's manic state. On the 
other hand, the theme for Hagatha Home is a slow, gloomy dirge with a blues solo injected into the middle. Both of these songs incorporate shifts in style to reflect Gloria's mood swings, but where the manic song shifts between insane glee and fury, the depressing one is just different flavors of miserable. Both songs manage to capture these moods while being memorably quirky, and the same can be said of the song that we hear as we call down the balloon and move up to the catwalks. The Phantom's theme is tense and melodramatic, an exaggerated take on the score that might accompany our particularly hammy murder mystery, and it works wonderfully. What doesn't work so well is the catwalk section itself. There's not a lot going on here in terms of story or character details. The only enemies you run into are the all-too-common censors, and the tight and closed platform placement does not play nice with the game's at times wonky camera. Camera. This short section isn't exactly a chore to navigate like Meat Circus can be, but it's not all that fun either. Fortunately, it's followed by my favorite boss fight in the entire game. The Phantom bars Raz's way across the final stretch of Catwalk, so Raz has to light a spotlight to scare him away. This is a good teaching moment, a way of cluing players into the fact that light is the boss's weakness before combat begins. Raz follows the Phantom back down to the theater, where it's revealed that he was Jasper all along, to nobody but Raz's surprise. I totally guessed that. Uh-uh, you said it was Becky. I might be naturally inclined to like it because of my own history as a critic, but hot damn is the ensuing boss fight ever inventive. Jasper flies around on his balcony seat shooting pointed criticisms at Raz, proving that words can do just as much damage as sticks and stones. How can I say this and still sound cool? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Fun fact, the nasty words that pop out of Jasper's projectiles were all taken from a real review of the Wyans Brothers movie, White Chicks. Jasper also hilariously criticizes Raz's fighting style and platforming skills in the middle of the fight. A terrible fight! Not up to the task at hand! And Raz fires back with some witty retorts of his own. On top of being well written, this boss is pretty fun to fight. Dodging the projectiles on your way up to the rafters is a good creative use of the levitation power. It's kind of a shame that there aren't more bits like this in the rest of the game, and the enemy combinations the game throws at you as you knock him down with the spotlights are actually paced out better than those in the level itself. In terms of metaphors, I've already discussed what parts of Gloria Jasper represents, but I think there's also some significance in the spotlight being his weakness. Gloria feels a lot more confident with a spotlight on her, as we can see from her first mood swing, and Jasper is fueled by her insecurities. And of course, Bonita, the source of Gloria's confidence, is a being of light herself, so this highlights the difference between those aspects of her personality. Once Bonita begins to shine again, Jasper shrinks to the size of a mouse with a voice to match. Oh, you've got fat arms, you heavy, big fat arms like a wrestler, and a little cheeky gobble hanging from your neck. And with that inner light restored, Gloria is finally able to step out of the spotlight in the real world. She's at last comfortable with moving on from theater and getting on with her life, which, depending on how Boyd's actions at the end of the game shake out, may be rather short. Gloria's theater is often overlooked, since it comes in the middle of four equally great and perhaps more thematically memorable stages, but in terms of both design and writing, it's a truly great level. It has some of the funniest dialogue in the entire game. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. The young boy's protests, though heartfelt, quickly lapsed into simplistic and tedious platitudes. One and a half stars! And it shines light on a misunderstood mental disorder in a way that's interesting and unique. And here's where I disclose a bit of bias. It also has personal significance to me. Someone close to me struggles with bipolar disorder, and analyzing this level helped me to understand what they've been going through just a little better. Psychonauts has so many great levels that it's impossible to name an absolute favorite, but I can't deny my love for this one. At any rate, I hope you enjoyed this inaugural episode of What's in a Game. If you did like it, or if you've got some ideas for how to improve future videos in the series, leave a comment telling me what you think, and maybe click the thumbs up button or subscribe if you're so inclined. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to tackle next month, so suggestions in that regard would also be appreciated. What I do know is that I'm reviewing Splatoon with my buddy CJ from What's With Games, and that should be up by the end of January. If you want to hear me talk some more, last month I did a review of Life is Strange that I'm pretty damn proud of, and I also did an interview on the King of Limbo podcast recently, which I'll link to in the doobly-doo. If you've ever wanted to know more about me, that's the place to go. As always, this is Jeff Thu, Professional Shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.